cell requirements. So we have autotrophs and we have heterotrophs. Autotrophs make their own food and energy from inorganic compounds, okay, inorganic. Photoautotrophs and chemo, uh, sorry, yeah, chemoautotrophs, okay, um, there are two types of autotrophs, photoautotrophs and chemoautotrophs. Then we have heterotrophs. Heterotrophs cannot make their own food, so they have to ingest organic uh, compound, compounds as a source of energy, okay? So autotrophs are also known as primary producers. They can make their own food from inorganic compounds. Heterotrophs, however, cannot, so they have to ingest um, or organic compounds as a source of energy. Okay, so if um, you're a heterotroph and you need to um, ingest organic nutrients, you require carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. If you need to uh, consume inorganic um, compounds, you require water, minerals, salts, and gases. Okay, cellular respiration and photosynthesis. So Cellular respiration, let's start there. Firstly, it's a set of metabolic reactions and processes in cells where we convert nutrients into ATP and release some waste in the process. Okay, we convert nutrients into ATP. It occurs in the mitochondria, as we said. It's the first stage of cell, sorry, its first stage is glycolysis, where we basically um, convert glycogen um, or sugar into ATP. The second stage is either aerobic or anaerobic respiration, dependent on whether the cell has access to oxygen. Okay, so the processes differ in that aerobic respiration creates 34 ATP units, um, whereas anaerobic re respiration creates only two. So aerobic uses oxygen. Um, what does that mean? It means that it's more, it's able to produce more energy, okay, because it has access to oxygen and it can use oxygen. Anaerobic doesn't have access to energy, uh, oxygen, so it doesn't produce as much energy. What is ATP? ATP is the currency of energy. So if I say, what is money? And then you start talking about dollars and you, I, let's imagine I would be like, what is a dollar? I was asking about money. What does a dollar have to do with anything? You would explain to me, oh, money is the way, sorry, dollars is the way in Australia that we measure money. If you have $34, that's how much money you have. Same thing for ATP, okay? How much energy do you have? Oh, I have 12 ATP. I have 34 ATP. So if you have access to oxygen, aka you're performing aerobic respiration, you're producing 34 ATP. Whereas if you don't have access to oxygen and you're performing anaerobic respiration, you're creating only two ATP. So as we can see, much less. The way I like to remember it is aerobic respiration. I think of aerobics, um, the big kind of fad in the 90s. That was like the health kind of thing. Um, that was done by humans, required us breathing in oxygen when we get puffed out. So aerobic, right? Aerobics, the kind of um, fad, sports fad that happened in the 90s required us to breathe in oxygen aerobic. Anaerobic was the opposite. So that's the way I like to remember it. Okay, moving on to photosynthesis. So photosynthesis is not used by humans or animals. It's used specifically and only by plants, okay, um, and some bacteria. It's, uh, the process converts light energy into chemical energy that can later be released to fuel the organism's activities. It occurs within the chloroplast of the cell, as this organelle contains a green, green pigment called chlorophyll, which is capable of absorbing energy from sunlight. So the chlorophyll captures the energy from the sun, and then um, in the chloroplast, it uses that energy to produce, sorry, yeah, to produce a form of energy that can actually be used by the cell. Because the cell can't use light energy, it needs it to be transformed into or converted into chemical energy. Um, so those are the two different ways that energy is produced in animals and in plants. So is it important that you know this? Yes, most certainly. Okay, because again, I've seen plenty of questions where they literally ask about the difference between cellular respiration and photosynthesis. Okay, so glucose plus oxygen. Um, so this is for cellular respiration. This is kind of the chemical equation for it. So we get glucose from food, we breathe in oxygen, and we use it to make carbon dioxide, 
water and energy, what we're interested in, okay? So glucose and oxygen is used to make carbon dioxide, which we'll breathe out. Water, which we'll use for other purposes. And then energy, what we're especially most interested in. Then carbon dioxide for photosynthesis now. So this is cellular respiration. This is photosynthesis. In photosynthesis, carbon dioxide and water and light. So carbon dioxide is taken in by these plants, which is why we need to plant so many of them to combat global warming. That's why people say it, because in this process, it's taking in carbon dioxide. It's also taking in some water and light energy, it's, and then it's converting it into glucose and oxygen, the good, which can be used by the cells, especially this glucose, to perform cellular tasks in the plant. Um, and the good thing about these equations is, if you'll notice, they're the same, just reversed. Here we have glucose plus oxygen equals carbon dioxide, water, and energy. And then it becomes carbon dioxide, water, light instead of energy. It becomes glucose and oxygen. Okay, so practically the same. All right, enzymes now. Moving on to enzymes. What is an enzyme? So an enzyme is a protein that helps speed up chemical uh, processes that happen in the body. How do they help speed it up? Well, they give certain molecules more energy um, so they can perform a task. So uh, let's say to do a function when, okay, when you wake up, let's say you wake up and you you decide you're going to go on a run for two kilometers. You need a certain amount of energy to run for two kilometers. Imagine you've stayed awake for like 72 hours. You don't have enough in the bank physically and mentally to actually run two kilometers if you've been awake for 72 hours. Okay. You just can't do it. But let's say you drink heaps and heaps and heaps of coffee and you get all this caffeine and it suddenly is giving you more and more and more energy. You're meeting the threshold that it takes for you to finally go out and have, a, have that two kilometer run. Okay, You're meeting the threshold eventually as you drink more and more coffee. That's the same kind of thing for enzymes though. In your body, there are certain molecules and they require a certain amount of energy to perform tasks. But let's say they're all really tired. They all can't be bothered. Enzymes will give them that energy and then they're, they're able to do the task. Um, okay, the only thing is that they don't actually increase the energy to give them the energy to do the task. They're actually reducing the amount of energy needed to perform a task. So let's say to go on that two kilometer run, you need this amount of energy. Um, let's say the caffeine is bringing it down to only this much. So then once you get up to here, you're able to go out on the, on the run. That's the same thing that enzymes are doing. Okay. They're not necessarily giving the energy. They're actually reducing the amount of energy required to perform biochemical processes in the body. So how does an enzyme actually do that? Well, it binds to molecules, specifically substrates, to do this. There are two different ways that we've kind of modeled the way enzymes bind to substrates. There's the lock and key hypothesis. And then we have the more common, the more modern induced fit model that we use today. So in the lock and key hypothesis, the substrate kind of fits in precisely um, on in this active site. Okay, so the enzyme um, binds precisely on the active site of the substrate. Um, and then it, it kind of locks into place, right? Just like when you put a lock in, it's the perfect fit. And then um, once it binds to the substrate and forms an enzyme substrate complex, it binds and then we have the product that's being um, released, okay? Which um, through this process, we're reducing the amount of energy required for biochemical processes, okay? However, now we have the induced fit model, which states that it isn't an exact fit. Instead, the substrate will basically um, bind to the enzyme as the enzyme, oop, as the enzyme changes shape around the substrate, okay? It, induces itself or it changes itself to fit to the substrate and then it forms the enzyme products complex and then the products leave the active site of the enzyme okay so here we have the active site being a 
perfect fit for the substrate. Here we have the enzyme, sorry, the substrate inducing, the enzyme inducing its fit to meet the shape of the substrate. And this is what we go by nowadays. Okay, um, there are some environmental factors that will affect enzyme activity. Enzymes, just like all proteins, will denature. That means they will stop working at a certain point. So certain enzymes can only exist at certain temperatures, just like humans, right? We can't go, I actually don't know the specific temperature we can't go above, but let's just say it's like 50 degrees, 60 degrees. Once it hits 60 degrees, it's bye-bye humans. Same thing for enzymes, okay? Not necessarily 60 degrees, but it's some kind of range of temperature that when that's exceeded on either extreme or either end, um, the enzymes denature or they stop working. So that's the same for pH. It can only exist in particular uh, pH levels, temperature, and substrate concentration. Okay.